All right. Jane is back to discuss the final chapter of the book of Job with me, which is only fitting because Jane inspired this entire project. She said, she said, Luke, how can anyone take you seriously if you're not doing a deep study of the Bible? And I said, Jane, I'll raise those stakes. I'll do a line by line analysis. And boy, I bit off more than I could chew. I thought I'd get it done in a few weeks, a month tops. And here we are three months later, but I'm glad that you decided to come on and do the very final chapter with me. Well, thanks for inviting me back. I had no idea that I inspired this, but I will say that I'm very impressed that you got through it um, in the way that you did. So I, I haven't seen anyone else do something like this. So very, kudos to you. Yeah, I did. I Every once in a while, I'll take a look on YouTube because I didn't even think about that. I was just like, oh, I got, I got to do a chapter of Job today. And I went on YouTube. It's like, no, no one's ever done this. There's like, you know, there's like a big, someone will do like an hour long thing where they're like, let me tell you about the book of Job in a nutshell. Or like maybe someone will do like a sermon on a chapter, but I don't think someone's gone through. Not, not that like what I've done is exhaustive. You know, it's certainly not exhaustive. It, you know, there are many times throughout the whole series where I was like, yeah, that's for somebody else to figure out. I'm just like, some people say this and some people say that and you know, obviously I couldn't dwell on everything, you know. We're even going to do a little bit of that today, probably, you know, in this last chapter, it's only, I think it's only 17 lines long, but it's philosophically richer than the ones that I, I think many of the ones that preceded it. I agree. There's a lot to unpack and retrospectively, but also looking forward. So both. Yeah. So we have, 40 minutes, so we can discuss a little, but we don't want to, <laughs> you know, you and I can uh, go on quite the rabbit trail. So let's just get into it, okay? Sounds good. And and, and I, you know, I don't have any comments until line six. Um, if you want to stop me, with, I'm going to go slow through it. And if you want to stop me and say, I have actually a comment here, just interject, okay? Sounds good. Okay. I guess I'll start and then you can you can read the next ones. Um, chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore, have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here, I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare unto me, and declare thou unto me, sorry. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So after all the thunderings of Yahweh and really having it described to him, all the things that God has dominion over and what he is responsible for, this, this is the thing that gets Job to finally repent, not all the um, arguments from the friends and from Elihu. It comes from the uh, Almighty himself. He finally gets it. He gets it through his thick skull. What say you, Jane? So, I, you know, uh, I, I kind of started by reading through the whole chapter and sort of meditating on it and kind of trying to outline the chapter itself. And, and I, I kind of divided it up into three different sections. And, and the first section was the one that you just read, verses one through six. And it's basically Job humbling himself before God and repenting. But this section, it, it, you can break it down even further, I think. Sure. Because, of course um, you can. Of course you can. <laughs> because there's a path to the to the repentance and and job models that so well um you know it, that first part where you know they say job answered the lord well this is the second time that job spoke to the lord that's right um, and the first time he basically said i can't speak he didn't actually say anything right 
that's all he actually said. I, I can't even say anything um, it, it, when I'm as I'm being confronted with God's majesty and greatness. And so so here he says, you know, he he realizes at this point there are words that he has to say and he has to get to that repentance. And so he starts with verse two, which is I know that I can't do everything. You know, I can't you know know everything. Um, and there's no thought withholding from you, God. He, so he starts by worshiping God, which is so interesting because that's kind of, um, and I'll, and I might come back to this later. It's kind of how how Jesus teaches us to pray. You know, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's that like worship that he begins with, and I then promise, he goes, I promise you, we're going to come back to the parallelism <laughs> with that. I promise you, that's going to happen. <laughs> Okay, I'll hold you to it. Um, and then in verse three, he actually goes into a confession um, where he's like, who hideth counsel from knowledge? I have uttered things that I did not understand, too wonderful for me and things like that. Um, but it's this, it's, it's the fourth verse that I found interesting because he re repeats words that God himself spoke and God himself spoke these words twice earlier. And he, he basically, he says, you know, Job says here, I beseech thee, I will speak, but he quotes God when God said, I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. And it, in the previous chapters, I think it was uh, chapter 38, verse three and chapter 40, verse seven, where God says that line, but he, he starts it with gird up, gird up thy loins like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. So this is Job basically saying, I'm answering this call that you've, you've called me to kind of do. There's, there's an action that I'm supposed to do and I'm, I'm answering that. Um, but then, but then he kind of goes into verse five and, um, and, and his answer is really only, he really, he realizes he can't really answer. All he has is humility and repentance. That's all he can do before this almighty God that, you know, the last few chapters we just heard so much about. And so, um, so, you know, in verse five, he says, I've heard of thee and by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. And it's almost echoing, well, kind of uh, foreshadowing probably, you know, what, what the blind man that got that Jesus healed in the New Testament, this this idea of this, I was blind, but now I see. Um, and so I think that's in John chapter nine. Um, but, but another interesting fact about this idea of being blind and seeing is that in Job chapter 29, Job himself spoke about himself and how he was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. And, and had, that was how he was in his community and amongst his peers. And so for him to be able to say now, you know, I, I couldn't see and now I can, that's kind of a huge thing because it is, it is a very humbling statement. Um, and so, you know, then we get to verse six, you know, he repents where, you know, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Uh, and so there's that repentance via the worship and the confession. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. I don't know if you had a, additional thoughts on that. Well, look, there's so much to say, right? Like the, you know, he says, uh, you know, prior to, to, to seeing and having the audience with God, you know, he, he understood a lot of the things through his ear. What does he say? I have, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, which is an interesting question. Uh, did, you know, this is, you know, this, is, this gets into sort of tension, right? Jesus says that no man has, you know, come face to face with God. Right. But I guess Job has, but he has through the whirlwind, right? God has taken on the cloak of the whirlwind. He, so he, it, for God to come into this plane of existence, he has to uh, put on this garment of a storm. So it, it's an interesting question about what Job is actually perceiving. Okay. Like that's, that's a deep philosophical and theological subject, but I think it's a the the point I wanted to make here is you know how would you sum up the 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 response to Job by Yahweh and does it ultimately um repudiate everything that Job has done 
right? I mean, is 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 Job were the things that Job was saying about maintaining his innocence and the wicked prospering in this realm and all these other things, were they fundamentally wrong? And I think we'll see that they probably weren't. So how Job ends up ends up in the position of repentance. I think does he get there by new knowledge? When God illuminates all the different things that he is responsible for and the dominion he has, especially when he talks about behemoth and Leviathan and how he can like talk to them and like, you know, control them, et cetera, et cetera. When Job's like, oh yeah, yeah, I repent now. Like, are those good arguments? Are those arguments at all? Are those like emotional responses to the divine where we have to put our intellectual knowledge and our ethical knowledge aside and repent? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, how did God, uh, God enumerates all the different things that he's responsible for and how much power he has. Ought that intellectually to have led Job to a position of repentance? I think it all works together. The, okay, the, help, me, help me understand. Well, I, you're, <laughs> you're assuming I understand it all. Um, I I think it all works together. You've got your your emotional, your spiritual, your 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 you know physical, all of that kind of you know it works it works together to help us understand God. What do you think Job learned from the counsel with God? Not to put you on the spot. I'm just we're just dialoguing here. Yeah, you know, and, and that's and that's where I I think it matured his relationship with God. It, it, and does does that is that sufficient? Um, it's like saying uh, it, it, so. The whole the whole book of Job, there's this tension. Well, you know, how could a good God allow this to happen? You know, how could that how could that be? Because Job is this innocent man, and this problem of pain, the problem of suffering, it's just it's completely displayed here. How can we trust this God who allows this? Right? You know, he he had this moment with Satan in the beginning, and it almost seemed, um, you know, it almost seemed flippant. In some ways, even though that's not kind of, you know, I hesitate to even say that, but but um, but, but the the more you look at it, and as you sort of see Job's suffering progress, and then when God finally speaks, it, it really, you know, and I don't, I, I think my take home from the book of Job is that this really wasn't about Satan at all. I, I think Satan was was used by God to show himself. Uh, to Job and to Job's friends and to have all of them have this deeper understanding and knowledge of God. And, and so I think the let, me, let me get that straight. I'm not trying to interrupt you here, but just, just because the pronouns slip all over the place. And I had such a problem with this when I was doing the book of Job, because it's, it, it, the, it's grammar structure isn't necessarily like ours. Are you saying that God arranged this, the trial of Job and the wager with Satan in order to introduce himself to Job, like that this was ne like the necessary machinery to make that happen. That's an, it's an interesting idea. I do believe this that because even in the new Testament, you know, we, we hear that God works all things together for the good um, of those who are called according to his purposes. And Job is obviously called according to his purposes. So, uh, you know, so, Yes, maybe that is what I'm saying. Well, that's, um, that's that's very interesting because it it raises a larger question about why, you know, why the the tree of knowledge of good and evil was put into the garden to begin with, why the serpent was there, why Christ incarnates. And this gets into the question of, is Job a prefiguration of Christ? Is can we look at Job's situation in a vacuum and say, oh, we just got to we got to do the moral and, and theological calculus with Job. But no, it's like really Job is part of a sequence that that was set in motion long before it exi he existed and long after he existed. And the calculus really involves the fall and the redemption of man. That, that's an interesting question, I think. And I, I have to say. If I were to answer the question that I put to you about what Job potentially learned. You know, he's got all the, you know, Job was an intelligent guy. He's not, it's not, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. God's, you know, the almighty, he controls everything. I get it philosophically. But perhaps when he was 
when in, when God detailed the machinery of of the realm and the universe to him, um, he could be like, I look, I've spoken out of turn here because, like you're saying, everything is working towards this glorious end, and he needs to think of himself within that larger uh, uh, divine mechanics. And and I could I could see that um, potentially leading to the repentance aspect, like that he ultimately this has to take place for like a salvific plan for all of creation and he i guess he should still feel somewhat lucky lucky that he gets to be a participant in that plan so like so let's let's you're not wrong joe because i think god says this he's no joe wasn't wrong in crying out for justice what where job erred from my understanding of this of this chapter and what God is saying, because he chastises his friends and not Job for this, is that um, uh, the 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 tone that Job registered his complaint was out of turn. He he he. Um, that that was that was my that was my understanding of it. That he was mm -hmm. speaking about this. He he was he was not giving God the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps, and, and then some scholars do say that 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 there was pride creeping in, in into Job's uh, language. I guess you could yeah, say well, or tone well, he, he, he as as he as could, a He could have been prideful in his. He, he could have been pride. I guess it's an interesting question. Can you be a righteous person and prideful in your righteousness at the same time? Because that's what Job would have. That would have been the sin of pride for Job. He's like, look. I've done no wrong. I'm completely innocent. I've done all these good things where I've, you know, taken care of strangers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, can that lead to the, to this contaminating feeling of pride? I, th I think so. I, 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 obviously, yes. Uh, I think that is the danger of being too perfect, right? There's no such thing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? So, this idea that none of us are perfect and pride is probably the thing that does creep in when we do sort of uh, move in the, in the direction of holiness it, we have to guard against the pride. Um, so, so I would, I would agree with that for sure. Um, but, but I think the, the, the thing that I wanted to kind of get into was this idea that the reason this, perhaps the reason that we sort of don't like the idea of God allowing Job to suffer is because so often we think of, we, we think of someone as we would, uh, you know, a neighbor or someone that we know, um, you know, allowing something bad to happen to us. And then, um, and then, still calling them a good person. Does that make sense? And so in some ways, if we're thinking of God in human terms, then then there is that there is a, a little bit of a bristle in, in our hearts and minds towards that scenario. But when you replace that person with God himself, his very character, I think changes. And I think that's one of the ways that this whole book, when you hear God speak of himself and, and who he actually is, he isn't just some person that we know who could, you know, allow us to suffer. He He's God himself. And that very nature of him as God uh, changes everything. And it's the reason that Job finds comfort in God alone when he's been seeking it through his friends, you know, he's been seeking comfort throughout, throughout his suffering, and he only finds it through God himself. And, and so, so it's, it's, it's these um, counterintuitive uh, aspects of, of thinking about what's going on that don't make sense until you start thinking that, no, this is not just a certain person or another person, this is God. And, and, and I think that's what changes our understanding and, and and I'll be the first to say I don't know if I completely understand it or, or no. it makes perfect sense but it, it doesn't have to make perfect sense we're just learning from the dialogue I will say this because we can talk about this forever it's already 7 20 we've got 20 minutes left would you mind uh reading uh, us to uh verse 10 all the way through to verse 10 sure um so this is verse 7 
And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Oh, wait, I skipped a verse. Verse nine, uh, prior to this. So Eliphaz and the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according to the Lord, according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. All right. So I we've covered a lot of the subjects here already, but I, I think it just... Just to drive home the point um, that uh, God comes out against the friends because they judged Job incorrectly by implicating that he had these secret sins when he did not, right? So they, they've they committed a sin against their brother in a way and have to offer up this burnt offering atonement. But Job has a role in this well as well. We talked about how he comported himself and he's got to pray for his friends, which is kind of you know, these are his adversaries in a lot of ways. These guys were, you know, these guys were quite antagonistic, insisting the most terrible things about him. And it's this him, him praying for his friends and the Lord also accepting Job. There's a lot of people who think be, for these reasons, you know, the suffering that he has to go through, the um, the recuperation of everything that he lost, right, kind of in a way sort of foreshadowing uh, the passion of Jesus Christ and acting as a priest and an intercessor for his friends. I think it, the big the big thing that I would, you know, you could write books and books about this. What does it, you know, a lot of the commentarians have to say that, you know, it's, it's passages like this that make people think that Job was a Christ figure or, or a prefiguration, of whatever that means. Does that mean he was like kind of, acting out the role kind of like an understudy like trying it out like what's going on here or is this something bordering on a christophany uh, of some sort like what what do you think about this i don't i don't know about a an actual prefiguration or christophany i'm not sure i even understand what that means <laughs> i don't think i understand what it means i'm just throwing around some words i heard somewhere <laughs> I do think, though, that, and, and, and as you sort of start seeing this throughout the Old Testament, everything is pointing towards our need for an intercessor and our need for a mediator. And it's not just Job. You see that in Joseph. You see that in um, David. You see that in multiple uh, characters who, who come through in the Old Testament. And, and so I, I think everything is pointing towards ultimately Christ and our need for Christ and that redemptive work of Christ to allow us to have that relationship with God the Father uh, directly in, in a way where we don't have to make these sacrifices like Job's friends. You know, Christ is our mediator. He is that, um, you know, what does it say? The, the in I think it's James, where they talk about the prayers of, um, I think it's James 5, 16, the, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And Christ is that righteous man. There is no other righteous man. None is perfect, right? So, um, so there is that aspect of Job. I also think that, you know, Job is pointing towards Christ, but Job himself has, is, is sort of uh, completing his own story as well. And, and that story is this idea that, you know, God doesn't accept Job until he prays for his friends. And, and you see that, um, you, you see that God says that, that he accepts, uh, you know, accepts 
also accepted Job's, I think it's verse nine, um, after they made their sacrifices, um, according to what God had commanded. And so I, I, I had really been struck by this idea that not only were his friends making a sacrifice, but Job himself was making a sacrifice because at some point he has to forgive them. And he has to say, you know what, not only were you not comforters to me, but you added to my affliction. And that's a heavy thing to be able to kind of go and then be able to actually pray for them. To be able to pray for somebody, you almost do have to want want them to be right, want them to have that relationship with God. You want, you have to forgive them almost before you are able, able to do that and put aside the anger and the bitterness. So he does he does put on, um, you know, the some characteristics of God himself. He shows that mercy. He shows the steadfast love um, to his friends in, you know, uh, obeying God's command to pray for them. So I, I thought that was so interesting. Uh, and, and it does sort of show that deeper relationship, I think, as well. I agree. There's a lot of thoughts that I have going on here. I mean, Obviously, you know, thinking about the parallels between Job and Jesus, right? Like Jesus obviously suffers anguish. Like you think about him crying out on the cross and asking if this cup could be passed from him. But, you know, Jesus never uh, is hes hesitates to pray for others. Like we see Job make a sacrifice early on for his children in case there was like the slightest possibility of sin somewhere, right? He does a burnt offering, he does the burnt offering again, but you make a fine point to point out it, it wasn't until he prayed for his adversary. And then, you know, Jesus spoke about that from the very beginning, right? I, I believe that's in the Sermon on the Mount, right? So uh, I think that's a fine thing to point out um, as a point of similarity and dissimilarity between the two figures. The other thing we haven't talked about here is uh, God does not demand uh, reconciliation with Elihu. Maybe we should talk about that real quick. Well, we have two minutes to talk about Elihu before we, <laughs> just to keep us on on schedule. <laughs> he, he said, "What? Why doesn't why doesn't God go after Elihu?" You know, um, you know, not Elihu isn't the only one who's missing from this last chapter, right? The finale. Satan is not there. Joe that's, that's not yeah. There. Where, where did, well, you would think that like Satan would come back in here and God be like, yo, <laughs> how do you feel now? You know? Yeah, take that right now. I feel like there should be an epilogue, like, well, yeah. where they, oh, you, you I, played I think, a good game, Satan, but I told you how it was going to end up. You didn't I, believe I think me. it doesn't really matter um, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, there, there was this great quote. And I'm just going to read it really, really quickly. It was from Matthew Henry's commentary. Um, and he basically said, uh, and he's speaking of Job. He said, his troubles be began in Satan's malice, which God restrained. His restoration began in God's mercy, which Satan could not oppose. Mercy did not return when Job was disputed with his friends, but when he was praying for them. And so this idea that, God was still in control of Satan's, you know, setup, essentially, you know, God, God was still ordaining things for, for, for Job's good and also the good of his friends. If you notice, I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, God doesn't hold his friends accountable for what they did to Job. He says that they had not spoken of God uh, of that which is right. Um, and, and so it's almost like saying, you know, your sin was first and foremost against God himself, not against your fellow man, and, and it, which kind of makes well, sense. Well, where were they wrong? Where were they wrong? I mean, and I think it's, it's, I think it's shown uh, where in, in the omission of Elihu, I, Elihu, however you say his name, but Elihu, you know, uh, Elihu primarily went after Job for his tone and for his impatience. Well, but I mean, how much, you know, how patient could Job be, you know, given everything that he experienced, right? But he said, look, no, hold on. He's like, God will make it, just be patient, just be patient. Like, and I'm, Elihu actually makes some prophecies that come true. And so it's, <laughs> and it's interesting. I think he sort of talks in such a way that he might be the mouthpiece for God. 
you know. So the, what did what did Alifu say about Job's friends? That they that he he was saying that you know that wisdom had eluded them that just because they, they went first in their um tr in in their prosecution of of Job because they were the elders. But then he says something to the effect, oh, well, the spirit's going to move, even though I'm younger and I don't have as much experience, et cetera, et cetera, the spirit's going to move in me and I'm going to be like God's mouthpiece. And I guess in a way he kind of was like, he gets some things right. He Ultimately, God does restore the harmony of Job's life. But um, it wasn't so much the thing, Elihu didn't really come after the principle of what Job was saying, because he, he, you know, Job is right. The wicked do prosper here, you know, and the most holy people are afflicted here. Yeah, Jesus and, himself was right. Jesus right. himself was afflicted, and and, and I think I, I think the words that his his three friends who are now being rebuked, the words that they spoke, came from an ill understanding of God and probably an ill relationship that wasn't as mature as Job's relationship. I mean, they they basically created and spoke of a mechanical God, right? You you do this, then this, this, and then this, and so it was sort of like uh, you know. Uh, ask, uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't a, a relationship per se it was you know if, if I if I give it was contractual right if I do this you do this and and you know throughout the bible this idea of a contractual relationship with the lord is kind of it's kind of a little heresy a little bit because you know, God doesn't treat us that way. You know, there, there is, there is that relationship that he has. He does create covenants. He does create relationships. And through Christ, um, he, he draws us into his family. We, we become sons and daughters. I mean, inheriting um, heirs with Christ. So there, there's something that they were saying that was actually wrong. Uh, I, I think about that. All right, we got eight. We got seven minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read the rest of this, and I'm gonna give you most of the floor here. Okay. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Keziah and the name of the third Karen Hapak. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. So all's well that ends well, right? I mean, the thing that I got kind of hung up on here, uh, Jane, is and and I you know, I went to the commentaries and maybe you looked at this as well is, you know, uh, what was it? Seven daughters and three sons. And that's what he had. He had at the beginning. Three, three daughters and seven sons. Oh, it's the other way. I have it mixed up. Okay. And it's like, it's, you know, I, I think, I think I remember looking at the Matthew Henry one. It was like blank. I was like, what? And the other ones were like, yeah, I got, you know, he had, uh, uh, seven sons and three daughters uh uh at the beginning it's numerically duplicated he gets back what he had before um i i i don't i mean this is problematic right like you know replacing people is different than replacing she asses right like you can't bring why didn't you know, I think the the question is why didn't he bring back the original children instead of duplicating them? Unless you want to say something to the effect that Job knew that those children were already in heaven or would be resurrected one day, and it's not to it's not certain to me that he had knowledge of those concepts yet at this stage in biblical history. So. I, I I struggle with this. I sure. Oh, oh, everything's okay. You've got you know the exact same number. We just restored the the 
the we restored the cattle and the donkeys and now you got the same number of kids back everything's okay right but, but i think it's I, I think there was a different understanding and there still is in, in certain cultures um is this idea that the children, you're right, they're very different from animals, and God establishes that very clearly in Genesis, right? Animals are animals, people have the, the spirit, right? There is that image of God. Um, but the children are themselves, first and foremost, they belong to God. And then, you know, they're entrusted to these parents. That's fair. So, That's fair. Right. That's fair. <laughs> That's fine. That's fair. That's fair. They're ultimately people are ultimately God's property. And he can do what he wants. Right. And, and, and there is this implication that, you know, Job did intercede for them. So they probably are with the Lord. Right. And so there is a comfort in that, hopefully. I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe reading more into this than than is um, necessary. Uh, but but I, I thought that was very interesting that you pointed out that the number of the children didn't double like everything else. Uh, but I, I think that also points to, again, that nature of man being in the image of God. Did you have any other thoughts on this? I, I have a few, but I actually if he was consistent. If, if there is consistency, there should have been six sons and, and 14 daughter or I, i'm sorry i keep getting mixed up uh six daughters and and 14 sons right so it breaks the it breaks the 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 doubling right but but it's but the the children that he receives in the end they actually are given additional earthly blessings so yeah, the daughters given. are like so beautiful and the daughters get an inheritance which is very unknown and and so i i think in in the book and they the produce they produce offspring so in some way that could be the doubling exactly but but there's this connotation about job's name being perpetuated not just through his sons but also through his daughters and it goes back to numbers chapter 27 there's a story of these daughters who's who's uh who had no who, they had no brothers and so they went to moses and they basically said you know hey uh, can we can we get our the inheritance of our father so that his and they literally say this so that his name um will be uh, not taken away from his clan essentially so so in some ways the fact that job's daughters receive this inheritance even when they have brothers it's this it's the sense that all throughout all of his 10 children his name gets perpetuated through his future so god has not just restored his present but god has restored his future um and and with that, like, there's so much more we could say, but I actually have one question for you. You have you have one minute. We have one I, minute. I know, I have one minute. I'm trying to get this question out. Um, so throughout this study, what would you say is the one thing that you would be able to take away? Oh my gosh. You've got one minute. <laughs> I've got, oh, I wish you'd give me a little heads up to think about that. Oh man, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, 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 I mean, look, I've said this before and I, it's not the conclusion that I'm supposed to take away from this deep study, right? And I know it's not necessarily your one you're going to want me to say, or it, it, it makes me increasingly curious about Gnosticism. And I know you don't want to, I know you don't want me to say that. I sh probably shouldn't be saying that, but it's it's been an interesting timing with all my work, you know, research on Young and reading Liz closely. I have to think about whether or not that repudiates that interest. I'm not sold on Gnosticism because it's it's 